And I now look to Arnie Matterson to close the case for the opposition. Madam President, it is a privilege to be here in the Oxford Union tonight and participate in this very lively discussion with its references to goldfish and malaria. <laughs> However, I cannot but disagree with the statement. The nature and origin of the financial crisis, which I find helpful for the purpose of analysis, to distinguish from the closely related Great Recession and European debt crisis that followed, is defined in its name. However, some attribute the cause to the deregulation of the financial market. That may be so, but that does not absolve the actors in the financial markets from responsibility for their action. As the late Frank Meyer, a former student at this university, said, and I quote, freedom brings man rudely and directly face to face with their own free actions. Quote ended. Brendan, in his funny speech, actually wound up the debate when he acknowledged that it would not have happened if they hadn't done it. However, the global financial world is more complex. So, my reply requires further clarification. The reply largely relates to the people and the companies, staff and owners, doing business in the financial sector, including Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but not solely. And it actually pains me, knowing that my own family, including myself, have been for generations involved in banking, and proudly still are. To say that this group is, due to their attitudes and behaviors, primarily responsible for the developments that led to the crisis. However, in this complex world, they cannot be alone. Nobody and nothing is an island. Illustrating this, I would put this group at the center of concentric circles as those that carry the greatest blame, but regulators, academics, policymakers, and legislators in zones of lesser blame further out. But most importantly, all of those have to be involved in the work to reduce the risk of another global financial crisis in the future. There are a few issues related to risk and responsibilities which I believe pertain directly to the crisis, which I would like to mention. There is no doubt in my mind that the culture and new financial mechanisms contributed to obscuring responsibilities. It was all about the art of the deal to borrow a phrase, with its fee income generating potential rather than the actual profitability of the enterprises. The bonuses then surely affected decision making. Then there are the ratings companies, a very important part in the complex system of banking, which led them under pressure to rely on external factors. Most notably, the likelihood of government support. How often did I dodge the question on if the government would support the banks? However, I could not dodge history, since more or less no bank had been allowed to fail in Europe post-World War II. Thus, they all got a AAA rating and lo and behold, they were right. The banks were almost all saved, except in Iceland. In this and in what followed, central banks and governments went far beyond what had ever been done before. 
This situation had enormous effects of how bankers behaved during the crisis and before. What they expected, even demanded, of the central bank and the government in the run-up to, to and during the crisis, they scrambled to be first in a queue for the handout without expecting to give anything in return themselves. If ever there was a moral, ha moral hazard situation, this was it. Why should they give anything in return? Well, these were their banks and their money. Yes, the banks were theirs, but it wasn't their money. According to Martin Wolf of the Financial Times, the median leverage ratio in the UK bank was 50 to 1. The equity ratio in the UK banks was 2%. In any other business, this would be very low equity indeed. Understandably, with so little at stake, but having taken all the profits and the bonuses, of course they were not very willing to take risks when it came to saving the banks. This was up to the central bank, the government, and the taxpayer. This is where we, need to, where we really need radical change, which we haven't seen yet. What we have seen is regulatory change, but even Ben Bernanke recognizes that changing regulations is not enough. All is, however, in essence the same as before, and nobody believes that those changes in themselves will reduce significantly the inherent risk of another financial crisis. But how radical should the changes be? There have been suggestions of 100% banking, the Chicago plan, narrow banking, etc. But all these changes would put enormous additional economic power in the hands of politicians and regulators. We don't want a banking system where the decisions have been taken by civil service regulators before the bankers. We also have examples of rather poor decision-making by politicians. UK politicians, I'm being very courteous now with my language, when British banks owned by nationals of other countries were concerned, for instance, and the rather grotesque use of the Terrorism Act in the case of Iceland. I also had the unfortunate experience of having the waiting room in the finance ministry in Iceland changed into a bank manager's waiting room overnight when the finance ministry had taken over all the banks. Which leads me to believe that the solutions to our problems are not to be found in more government power or influence on banking operations. Solutions of this ilk could also necessarily jeopardize economic growth for classical reasons of government involvement in businesses. Rather, we want solutions that we believe will lead to more responsible decisions within a private banking sector. Yes, for well that, we need legislation or regulation, but also solutions that ultimately would leave the operations on the responsibility, even in crisis, with the banks, but not the politicians or the taxpayers, as the case universally is at the present. In doing this, we need to consider three issues. First of all, as we learned in Iceland, if a bank fails, it doesn't disappear or vanish into thin air. There is still great value in place, which in fact has an owner in the failed banks, creditors and depositors. Banks, therefore, can be allowed to fail, and the government doesn't have to take the bank over and refinance it, since the creditors have, in a healthy economy, an interest to do this themselves. The mechanisms and mindset around the resolution and possible resurrection of failed banks needs, therefore, to be looked at and changed with this in mind. Secondly, <coughs> 
Under these circumstances, one needs to look in particular at the weak position of the dispersed and disorganized depositors and strengthen, and strengthen their position to avoid panic amongst them. This was pioneered in Iceland during the crisis by prioritizing the depositors' claims over the creditors' claims. This is now, I'm being told, considered by the EU. Lastly, I believe we have to raise the capital requirements of the financial institutions, make them more responsible in their own decisions because they have more at stake. You need a robust macro-regulatory framework for this, but not a framework that tells people unnecessarily what to do and impedes initiative. Good capitalism is not about being irresponsible and have others carrying your losses, but about responsible actions. Yes, take your winnings, but absorb your losses yourself. These changes that I have suggested can be done in many ways and need not to be done overnight, but should surely be done before we are at the risk of another financial crisis, because another crisis will come, and no later than when the actors in the last one have left the scene, to paraphrase John Kenneth Galbraith. The big question is, how far do we go in raising the capital requirements of financial institutions for the desired effect without adverse effects on a financially sustainable economic growth? This I don't know, but to figure this out should be the task of the academic community, your task, and later the legislative and regulatory branches. However, and this I know, if you don't do this, Wall Street is bound to repeat the mistakes of the past and we to relive another financial crisis with its economic consequences. I'm sure we agree we don't want to see this happen again.